Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the 2000 mile review of my Hyper Scrambler 2. We're going to be going over the positives, of which I have 7, the negatives, of which I have 6, problems after 2000 miles, highlights after 2000 miles, if it's for you, if it's not for you, and would I buy one again. Let's get started. Number 1 is battery life for the positives. Obviously the batteries can go roughly 80 miles, give or take, on a charge, depending on train, all the, all the standard depending on stuff, like train, winds, like the headwind, uh, temperature, all that kind of stuff. That's what it really depends on. Weight of the bike, weight of the rider, all that. Uh, positive number two is torque. It does have quite a bit of torque. But as I'm going to talk about in the negatives, there is a downside to that. But it definitely has enough to get you going pretty much at whichever pedal assist. Or if you're, obviously if you're in... R or race mode. It's gonna have it does a little bit more torque there, just because it's. I believe it's using a little bit more to get going, since it's going all the way up to 30 plus miles an hour, which leads into top speed. For me, on flat level ground, I have seen 34.4 on a full battery in race mode. That is my top speed, and that's pretty good because they advertise on the website of 30 plus. And I know there's been some people in the Hyper Scrambler 2 Facebook group that have been that have seen higher than that, which that again will depend on like all those factors like rider weight, weight of the bike, headwind. Temperature, all that. Uh, the fourth positive is the headlight, because that is very nice, very bright, and the fact that you can turn like the the full light on and off instead of just having the light entirely on or entirely off is very nice. The fifth positive would be the very loud horn. Because, obviously, getting people's attention while you're on a bike that is going 30 plus miles an hour is pretty important. So that is, comes in very handy in situations where you're, you would need it. The sixth positive is turn signals. Because, basically the same thing as the horn. Letting people know your intentions. And it's not, luckily, it comes with the bike. You don't have to get, like, a third-party so-and-so wireless one that could be shoddy, could not be shoddy. Or you'd have to get a wired one, in which case you would have to hide the wires within, more than likely, the frame of the bike. Which would probably look not that great. I have a similar issue with the rear-view camera, which I bought separately from the bike but that's my own problem I gotta deal with since it was not included with the original purchase of the bike and the la last big positive is for me at least the always on tail light which you would think would be a standard thing but not all e-bikes have an always on tail light some bikes don't even have a taillight to begin with. E-bikes, I meant. And there are some that have... Uh, I've seen smaller, like, lower-powered e-bikes have battery-operated taillights that basically you just push a button when you're riding and it's on. And it's just using 
running off of its own power source, which is the, like double or triple A batteries. Which I suppose is nice that it's not running off of the batteries of the bike, but at the same time, I can't imagine it's using that much power to keep that light on. All right, here are the negatives. Oh boy. Can you guess what my first one's gonna be? If you've seen my original video, I'm sure you know exactly what the first negative for me is gonna be. And I said I will keep mentioning, mentioning this until they change it. Number one is, of course, the seat. Horrible. I don't know why or what possessed them to use that kind of seat but if you want to ride longer than an hour which is entirely possible with batteries these size you, you're gonna get sore and uncomfortable and you're gonna start changing your position and trying to find a spot on the seat that is hasn't been squished down basically and it's just it's not good not good if you only plan to ride for maybe a half hour 45 minutes at a time it's okay but that does not negate the fact that that seat should have 10 times more cushion on it or should be completely reworked from the ground up to be a lot more plush because I shouldn't buy a almost four thousand dollar bike that I can't ride well I, I can ride it but I get pretty sore and uncomfortable after roughly an hour of riding that should not be the case ever for something that people are paying that much money for from a company like Juiced that has a fairly good reputation, give or take. Okay, enough about the seat. The second is a more specific thing on my bike is mine came with a bent front brake rotor. Now it didn't really affect anything until I want to say around between 500 and 1,000 miles. That's when the front brake pads were getting worn enough to where the bent brake rotor would rub, rub up against them a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit and enough to be like uh, enough for you to be able to hear it because it would be like and yeah I there's an entire story that I'll go mostly into about my dealings with uh, juice support customer support I'll um, try and make it a little brief I don't want this video to be like five hours long but I call them up get a hold of the tech or mechanical support whichever support you want to call them and I say hey my front brake rotor came in bent and the guy on the phone was great he understood exactly what was going on have no problems with the guy on the phone. It's when email was getting involved, which the first email I got was from the guy on the phone. He's like, just go ahead and see if you can get like a picture or a short video of it, of the brake rotor being warped or bent while you're writing it, or while it's at least spinning of some nature, which actually it turned out to be a lot harder than you think of a thing to do <laughs> but 
I got a little video, sent it to him, took some pictures too, sent it to him. And I heard nothing for over a week. And of course, by that time, I just went ahead and bought, I believe it's the exact same brake rotor. It was a Tektro 180 millimeter wavy brake rotor. I got that off of Amazon. I had it here within like two or three days. Took the old brake rotor off, put the new one on. Issue was fixed. Now maybe I shouldn't be too hard on them for that, but what if someone wouldn't know where to look to get the brake rotor? That's my thing. And the fact that it took them well over a week to even respond to this through email. And then they're saying, well, did it did the bike come like this? I'm like, yes, I told the guy on the phone that this was like this from the get-go. They're like, well, this isn't covered by warranty, but we can get you a discount on a new one. That did not sit well with me. I mean, okay, it's not under warranty. Cool. You couldn't tell me this from the very start and it took you a week to even s send an email saying that? That's not acceptable. There's no universe in where that's acceptable. At least not to me. But I told them I was not very ha not happy at all with that kind of response. And also, if someone didn't know that like Amazon sold them or didn't have a way to relatively quickly get a new front brake rotor, their bikes maybe not going to be out of commission, but it would be a little sketchy trying to use the at least the fr my front brakes. Which I didn't use that I don't use that much to begin with. I usually use my back brakes. But that's beside the point. It shouldn't be that way to begin with. Because if someone else had this problem, like I said, then what are they supposed to do? Plus, their shipping of anything, well, juice shipping of anything takes usually at least a week because they don't use uh, like well they're not Amazon they can't just ship things out in a few days but alright that's enough of that topic negative number three is the torque and cadence sensor can get I like to call it confused at times and gives a stall effect this happens when you if you're pulling on the throttle, like this, for me it happens at like a stop, and I'm getting ready to go. I pull the throttle, and if I turn the pedals a couple of times just to give a little oomph to it, that's when it does this. Because I believe it's because the cadence sensor senses the pedals turning. And it's also obviously sensing that I have the throttle on. So it's like, hey, these are both on. And when I stop pedaling, that's when it kind of it stops with the throttle for a second and then it goes. It's, a, it's kind of an odd thing. I'm gonna. I'll try to get like an example of it in a later video, but it's definitely kind of sketchy. I guess you could say. Negative number four would be mine. Well, this is another of 
my bike specifically. It came with a bit of a loose kickstand from the factory, which I didn't notice until a couple of rides into it. When I went to put the kickstand down, it was a little, yeah, it was a little wobbly. I mean, that that's not so much of a problem. You just tighten it up. That's not really a big deal, but I would think it wouldn't be that loose from the factory. You would think everything would be tightened down. Alright, number five. Not as much torque going up steep hills as you would think for a thousand watt motor. Now by steep, I mean like steep. Not like a little little hill or anything like that. Fairly big hill. I mean, I don't know what like grade that the one of the steeper hills around my area is, but it, I mean it's it is pretty steep. I can still go like I think it if I have it if it's not in race mode it's like 15 or 16. That's what it usually stays at going up the hill. If I have it in race mode it's it stays around 20. But still, I mean, race mode, that's all the power. And that's easily, I think, the peak wattage I've seen it draw from that was 1,800 and something. And 1,000 watt motor, and it pe it's supposed to peak at 2,000. So that's the reference point for that. But that's definitely something that... They don't tell you on the website. <laughs> Which, I mean, it's... That's wildly going to depend on the steepness, steepness of the hill, all that kind of stuff. But Alright, number six. And again, this is for my bike. Unknown brand, which... I mean, I know the brand name, but it's... It's not a, if you look up the brand of brakes I have, you're not really going to find much on it. And it makes it slightly unclear which ones you really need to replace it. Because there's, I've looked on the brake pads themselves, there's not really any specific markings or anything like that. But I, I did just get new brakes yesterday, and I put them on, and tested them out last night and they are doing pretty good and they they're not the, the same brake pads these are a resin brake pad but still they're not that they seem to be working and it's the same mechanism for putting them in all that okay problems after 2000 miles number one Almost a consistent need for new brake pads. Suppose you're supposed to swap them every 500 miles or so. I mean, that should maybe not be a problem, but it should be something that you should, pretty much everybody who gets an e-bike should be aware of. Is probably order a couple. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Probably order a couple of sets of brake pads ahead of time just to have them on hand when you get the bike instead of doing what I did and pretty much running my back brakes down to the actual metal of the <laughs> brake pad themselves. That's probably not great on the brake rotor, but that's taken care of now. Number two random electrical issue when plugging in my phone to the phone mount charger. This is very odd. It happens if at a standstill. And it doesn't do it all the time. But if I plug my phone into the charger, which is running off the same port that the like standard USB charger ran, ran off of, it will activate the motor up to around 60 watts. 
but my thing is, if I put the brake on, it stops, obviously, because the brakes have a cutoff for the motor. But I can't reliably reproduce the issue. That's my whole thing why I haven't reported it, because there doesn't seem to be a clear this makes this happen type of scenario. But I found that cycling the batteries off and then on again most of the time fixes it. Or I think all the time actually. That's just a very odd problem. And hopefully that... Honestly I don't have my phone charging on it that often for it to be that big of an issue. But it shouldn't be an issue to begin with. Alrighty, highlights after 2,000 miles. Number one, very reliable. Obviously, it's gotten me 2,000, oh, well, I think it's 2,030 now miles, and the motor hasn't exploded. I haven't had any pop tires. I'm going to knock on wood right now. Technically, even if I did have a pop tire, I have one spare tube, but I have zero spare tires. So, and those are commonly out of stock, but in general, it is a reliable bike. Number two, still getting the same performance from the batteries and the motor as I did on day one. That's pretty much it. Everything gives the same the same speeds are going out, the same battery life is coming is available, all that kind of stuff. Okay. It's for you if you want quite a bit of power that you can use as you see fit, meaning you don't have to go full race mode all the time to enjoy a ride on it. Which is Honestly, I cruise at 20 most of the time. And I use race mode from way out in the way out in the sticks. <laughs> sure that no pedestrians are really around or anything like that. Luckily, I have some quiet, very quiet back roads around me as you've seen in my videos. But pretty pretty nice number two you want to commute with, to work without a car but there is a little bit of a caveat to that and this is assuming you're willing to take the risk of it potentially being a theft target if it has to be left outside of your work I mean that's it's kind of with any vehicle you're just, even with cars, I mean, you're just, that's, I guess, assuming that no one's going to try and steal it. Because most cars have alarms these days. But, we'll get into that with one of the, it's not for you if parts, a little bit more. But, it's for you if... You don't have giant mountains around you that would burn through your any e-bike battery quickly. Even these, even these batteries, both batteries. If you got really big hills all over the place, if you're in the Appalachians or the Rockies, probably wouldn't get an e-bike to begin with. <laughs> we just get a little small gas-powered vehicle. Number four, you're okay with the wait time to get one unless you get really lucky. I haven't looked at it lately, but I would assume it's, we're in September now, you're probably going to be waiting until October before you would get one. And depending on where you live, that's going right into 
the fall winter changeover or at least within a month and also depending on how your winter is you might not get to ride it much at all which would really for me that would that would almost be a deal breaker like honestly if I was gonna order an e-bike unless it would get to me before I'd say November 1st I wouldn't order it just because at one I don't know how bad my winter's gonna be I live in Ohio which means it could that's pretty up in the air it could be a very mild winter it could be a very cold winter it could be a very dry winter it could be a very wet winter I don't know I can't predict the weather that far <clears throat> and neither can the weather service all right number five it's for you if you live in a southern state or a warm state I guess I should say and can <clears throat> and can ride comfortably year-round I put an emphasis on comfortably because technically you could ride it year-round and no matter the temperature but when you get into the uh, colder weather like I'd say around like 40 40 degrees and below you will see a definite drop off in range that's because of how the batteries react to cold temperatures like almost cut your range in half type of thing all right it's not for you if you don't want to deal with wildly varying local state federal laws regarding e-bikes this is something they really just need a standard on instead of having oh well the town says you can ride them here oh well the state says you can ride them here but well federal law says you can ride them here please 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 just put a standard on it class 1 e-bikes can do this class 2 e-bikes can do this class 3 e-bikes can do this and can ride here can ride there can't ride here can't ride there please stop with <laughs> with the variations I mean it's if I wanted to take my bike somewhere out like to a different state and if I didn't know enough to look up the laws in advance I could get in trouble it shouldn't be like that there should be an absolute standard to like it's just a pain a giant pain uh, number two it's not for you if you want to go faster than 40 I put 40 because some people like I've went almost almost 40 downhill before so but if you want to go faster than that don't get this bike it's not gonna do it unless you modify it yourself I don't know maybe put another engine or engine put another motor on the front I wouldn't begin to know how to wire all that up and do all that that's just me number three it's not for you if you live in an area that has a lot of theft now the alarm that comes with it will deter theft but if someone really wants it they'll get past that which I mean unless you're really good at hiding the actual alarm on the bike they'll probably figure out where that is and just rip that off and toss it I mean there are you could get a GPS tracker but most of those require a yearly subscription which I don't think they're that expensive for the yearly subscription but still it's something you could get 
Or you, sh you could just get a sticker that says your bike has GPS tracking on it to further deter theft. That's up to you. I don't I don't have one, but yeah. Number four. It's not for you if you get easily hooked into the more power drug. Like like me. <laughs> I started with a rad runner. Then I got a juice scorpion. Now I have a hyper scrambler too. Can you <laughs> I think if there was a chart on that you could see the a pretty sharp incline in power <laughs> and sadly it's expensive to do that <laughs> now the very big question would I get one again the answer would be no I would not I would either save up for a gas-powered small motorcycle or get the Aerial Rider Grizzly V2. <clears throat> Mainly for the... It does have dual batteries. They're not as high capacity as the Hyper Scrambler 2. But it has dual batteries and it has dual motors. Those are... The dual motors is what obviously the hyper scrambler 2 lacks and they're I believe they're still roughly the, around the same price the Grizzly might be a bit more expensive but I mean they're throwing in a second motor but I don't think the Grizzly has built-in uh, turn signals I don't think it may have I haven't actually looked at one in a while but all right that is gonna do it I want to thank everybody for watching I want to thank subscribers all that for going on this 2,000 mile journey with me all right see you later guys stay safe